AWS Lambda, launched by Amazon in 2014, was one of the first function as a service offerings in the cloud. So before we try to understand when to use it, let's see how it works internally. So let's say as a developer, you write a function to process some request. Think of it as how you would split your monolith into microservices. Similarly, you split your microservices further into multiple functions. So let's say you've written one such function and you are deploying that to AWS. So using the AWS console, you'll just upload your function code. Now this function is not running as of now on AWS compute, but instead it is currently stored in some form of AWS storage. After a while, whenever there is a request, AWS will check your configuration and on demand on a real time basis, it will deploy that function from AWS storage into AWS compute. So this is the point when your function will actually be running as an instance on AWS compute. Your function will take the request, it will do the processing. Let's say the processing is done very quickly in 300 milliseconds. It generates some output and now your function processing is done. At this point, since your function is no longer required, AWS will destroy that function instance completely. And the reason it does that is because you are going to be billed only for the amount of time your function was actually running in AWS compute. So in our case, that function was running for 300 milliseconds. So you will be charged only for that 300 milliseconds. So now we understand two features of function as a service or in this case of AWS Lambda. The first one is no upfront provisioning. That is you're not saying upfront how many instances of your function you want to have. And secondly, your billing model is pay per use. So you're paying only for the number of hundreds of milliseconds that your function will be actually running. Let's say after some time, let's say around after 45 seconds, another request comes in for your function. Again, at this point, AWS will take out your function from AWS storage and deploy it back to AWS compute. Again, same thing will happen for the second request also your function will be run for 300 milliseconds you will be billed for another 300 milliseconds and once its job is done again that function will be destroyed and you will no longer be charged for it technically behind the scenes that function is not destroyed immediately but rest assured when your function is not doing any processing of the request you are not billed for it anymore so we talked about one request coming after the other but let's say you have 400 simultaneous requests coming in for your function in this case aws will automatically deploy 400 instances of your same function so you will have 400 lambdas running at the same time this is called function concurrency and you can configure that so this again highlights two important features of function as a service which is no upfront provisioning as before you are not saying that have one instance of my function running 24 7 instead it is deployed on demand whenever there is an incoming request and the second feature is this provisioning is highly scalable so depending on number of simultaneous requests you get for your function those many copies of your lambda or of your function will be running simultaneously without you having to configure anything so from a timeline perspective you could have a single request and your single instance of the function will be running you will be built for 300 milliseconds or whatever time your function requires or you could have multiple simultaneous requests so in this case you have five function instances running at the same time so you will be charged 5 into 300 milliseconds for 1.5 seconds and so on and so forth so this provides us immense cost efficiency as well as scalability because you will never be paying for the compute that you do not use so we talked about how a function is deployed from storage to compute on an on-demand basis. That is whenever there is a request, a function is deployed. But we didn't discuss what is an actual request. So request is actually an event which is generated by a cloud provider based on the configuration that you do while creating the function. And the cloud provider in this case is AWS is capable of providing a lot many types of events. So let's say you have a task or a function which does some reconciliation of your data or which does a cache refresh 
or it does some report generation. So you have this task or a function which needs to be run only once every day at a specific time. In this case, let's say at 5 p.m. So in this case, instead of having a Spring Boot like application and doing a cron job scheduling within it and having that instance running 24 seven only to have that task being triggered at 5 p.m. We can just have an AWS Lambda or function as a service. So AWS provides us with a scheduler where you can configure to say generate an event at 5 p.m. And then you can tie that event with this function. So every day at 5 p.m. AWS will trigger the event. And since that event is associated with the function, that function will be deployed on demand. As soon as your task is done, that function will be destroyed. You can have your application run only for 5-10 minutes and pay only for that amount of time. Let's say you have an application where you allow users to upload a very high resolution image and you want to resize those images based on device sizes. You have one image for mobile, a medium image for tablet, a little bigger image for desktop. In this case, you can have an S3 bucket in AWS and tell AWS to generate an event, an S3 event, whenever there is an image uploaded in that bucket. So again, you do not have to run your function 24 seven. As soon as there is an image in the bucket, an event will be generated by AWS. And since you have tied that kind of event with the function, the function will be deployed on demand. And the function will take the image, will do some processing, will create multiple copies for different devices. And let's say it stores them back into a different S3 bucket. And when we talk about an event, this is the structure of an event in AWS. So your function is given a JSON, which represents the actual event. So in this case, for an S3 event, we only care about two things. We care about the bucket in which the image was uploaded and the actual name of the image. Using these two things, we will actually extract the image out of the S3 bucket and do the processing on it. And this event is automatically generated by AWS. Event can also be generated as an HTTP trigger. GitHub has this functionality of webhooks where anytime you push a commit, you can configure an HTTP URL to be triggered by GitHub. So your function as a service can also react on an event of type HTTP trigger. So every function that you deploy can have an HTTP URL which you can configure in other services. So in this case, you can configure that URL in GitHub. So every time there is a push commit, that URL will be triggered. And since that URL is triggered, an event will be generated to call your function. And within your function, you can take the data of that commit and you can use a Slack SDK API to post a message to your team saying that this particular commit has just been made. And this event can also be generated by a database. So let's say you have Let's say you're working on a social media app and whenever there is a new follower, there is an insertion of record in the database. You can configure your cloud provider to generate an event whenever there is a record insertion in the database. And finally, you can also have publish subscribe, which is Google Cloud's version of topics and queues to generate an event. Let's say you have a smart home temperature sensor and you're saying that whenever the temperature crosses 80 degree Fahrenheit, I want an event to be pushed into PubSub. This PubSub event will in turn trigger the function and in the function you can send out a command back to that smart home device, turn on the AC or turn on the fan since now the temperature has reached a certain threshold. Let's look at a demo of functional service in Google Cloud. So currently I'm in Google Cloud console, I'll open the cloud functions. I've already created two functions, but let's see the workflow for creating a new function. So the first thing it requires is you need to have a name for your function, which could be anything. The amount of memory you want to allocate to your function. You need to mention the trigger, which is the event that we want this function to be triggered by. So the first thing it, which is auto selected is HTTP. So your function directly gets an HTTP URL. So Google Cloud has created an HTTP URL which acts as a trigger for your function. You can change it to something else. You can say a cloud pops up can be a trigger to your function. Cloud storage which we saw similar to AWS S3 can be a trigger. Here you can specify the bucket in which whenever a file is uploaded your function will be called and so on and so forth. Once you configure the event source 
you can write the actual code for it and there are multiple ways to deploying your function or writing the code for your function so you can write your code in an inline editor within the cloud console itself or you can upload a zip file or you can point it to a cloud repository saying that this is where all my functions are deployed and you can ask google cloud to pick it from that repository and the next part we have to choose is the runtime so right now in google cloud these are the languages or runtimes which are supported so let's check out the java runtime if we select java it will give us if we select java it will show us a class where we can write our function as well as the pom xml where you can further add the dependencies for your extra libraries so think of your function as a very small nano service just like a microservice where it's an entire application but it runs for a very short amount of time so you can add any dependencies that you want and you can even have multiple classes in your code but only one function will act as an entry point whenever an event is triggered and that entry point you have to specify here at the bottom which says this is the class and within that class this is the function i want to be called whenever there is an event and here since it's an http event we are getting the parameters of http servlet request and http servlet response in the next set of options we'll just select the region where we want to deploy the code we can have a maximum timeout for the function so if the function does not complete within that duration it will be considered as a failure so you can set the maximum number of simultaneous function runs that can happen you can add some environment variables and then at the end you can say create so i've already created a couple of functions let's look at them so the first one is an http sample example and this dashboard shows you all the invocations to that function that has happened in the trigger it will show you what is the event source for this function to be triggered in this case it's the http url and then you can even test your function by coming to this tab so in this case i'll just test the function and here's the output i can also go back to the trigger and open this url in a new tab and it should ideally give me the same output so this http url has acted as an event trigger for my function to run and it got me the response the second function i created is similar to what we saw for the image resizing which is the aws s3 in a nutshell this function reacts to a file being uploaded in a bucket and in this case since it reacts on storage event you will get a gcs event which is a google cloud storage event and this class has a bucket name the name of the file that was uploaded and the metadata related to it using these things you can read from that bucket you can do your image resizing and you can upload it into some other bucket and of course since you are using the google cloud storage classes within the pom xml you can add your dependencies for google cloud storage and if we go to the trigger tab it will show us the details of our trigger event so here our trigger type is the cloud storage trigger it gives us the link of the bucket and the type of the event is create so whenever a file is created event will be triggered you can also trigger events on delete or modify moving on just like we had a single event triggering a single function we can chain these events and create an entire flow out of it so in this example we can say whenever there is an image uploaded to a bucket call an event that event will trigger a function that function itself as an output can put a message on a pop up and this itself can act as an event for some other function triggering that second function so output of one lambda or output of one function can act as an event trigger for the next function and using this you can chain multiple functions to act and create your architecture workflow so let's take an example let's say from your mobile sdk whenever there is a new user you are publishing that event on a pop up topic this lambda has this pop up topic as a source this function will validate all the parameters of the new user and if it is valid it will deploy it to let's say and database and we can configure dynamo db itself as a source of event so you can have multiple functions so in this case there are two functions both of which depend on this dynamo db event one of the functions will personalize the data for that new user and store it in a cache and the second function can use the details of the user and send a welcome email to the user 
So when you have an architecture where all your flows are based on events and chaining of events, it's called an event driven architecture. So we already saw a couple of providers on the cloud which provide this function as a service. One is AWS Lambda, other is Google Cloud Functions. And lastly, we have this chart having all the compute offerings available to us. So on the bottom left, we have physical servers. You can have cloud VMs, which are infrastructure as a service. You can have containers or Kubernetes, which is also available in the cloud as container as a service, which is platform as a service, which provides higher level abstraction and it is and more ease of use. And the next higher level abstraction is function as a service. So whenever you are creating a new application, so you should think of whether you can run your application as an event driven architecture using function as a service. If not, try to choose for platform as a service. If not, only then come down to containers and VMs. That's it for this video. Thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.